so lucky to be here tonight with such brilliant panelists as well, some great speakers and some wonderful projects that we're going to be listening to tonight. First, a little bit of housekeeping. So there's no scheduled fire drill tonight. So if you do hear the fire alarm, it's the real deal. So um, what you have to do is go to the nearest fire exit. There are two fire exits in this room. There's one here and there's one at the back. And once you go through those, you go out to the building, turn to the left, and there should be somebody in a high-vis jacket from Amnesty who will show you to the collection point. Toilets, toilets are on. If you come out the red doors here, um, turn left, and they're downstairs on floor minus three. And if you're coming back up in the left, we're on floor minus one. OK, it's a bit confusing, but so <laughs> right. So minus three for the toilets, minus one to get back up here. Right. And there's also. Postcards on your chair, right? So these postcards have got a QR code, right? So this QR code, if you scan it, will take you to um, a landing page, a when landing page, and that's got all the information um, about the publications. It's got links to all the publications that we're talking about. It's got information about tonight's event. It's got the speaker's wonderful bios, as we won't be going through all their bios, but it'd be really good for you to have a look at them because they're actually amazing people. Um, and it's got information about how you can join WEN, get involved in a lot of the WEN work. Right. And um, also the, for social media, our hashtags for today are hashtag food justice, hashtag feminist climate justice and hashtag when forum. So those of you that are active on social media, please do tag us and please do talk about us tonight on social media. So this evening we're going to start off with a short video, right? Um, and the short video is going to tell some food stories and then we're going to bring up the panelists and we'll have a discussion with our panelists. And following from that, there will be a Q&A session, right? Um, but we do want the audience to participate in the Q&A session. So there is going to be a little bit of flipping about who's asking the questions to who, right? And then to end the evening, we've got a music performance. Um, so please do, if you feel like it, get up and dance like we did last time. Um, I heard a lot of people enjoyed that. So hopefully we can do that again today. And then we'll have some final words from Kate, who's the co-director of WEN. Okay. Right, so as the world faces conflict, a climate crisis and the cost of living, it is it has never been more urgent than now to find new visions of a future food system. Right, so tonight's event will explore how community initiatives provide sustainability, affordability and food justice and why taking an intersectional feminist approach is key to just food and a climate transition. Right. So through our Feminist Green New Deal project, we found that people working on campaigning on the climate crisis rarely highlight how, it, how its impacts are shaped by gender inequality. And also, how does this interact with other inequalities such as race or disability? And at the same time, feminists working to end gender inequality don't always know enough about what the climate crisis means for women. Um, so food production, consumption and preparation is highly gendered, as we all know. So taking an intersectional feminist approach is crucial for working towards a just food and climate transition. So this evening, we will also showcase the findings of two key pieces of work that we've been working on. <clears throat> and so that's the Just Fact Blueprint publication and also the Feminist Green New Deal Food Policy paper as well. Right. So now, to kick off this evening, we're going to start off with a short video. This short video has been made by the Blueprint Architects Group, and it has been titled, How Can We Grow a Community-Led Food System? I started it from a seed and it just grew and grew. This is one of my neighbors and she's done really well. She's grown the hyphen beans and the flowers are absolutely gorgeous. Can you see? My name's Hanufa Islam and this is a community garden and we all enjoy growing our own vegetable and plants. The purpose of St Hilda's Food Co-op is to provide fresh, 
affordable food to local residents and it's very traceable back to where it's came from, from the soil to the plate and it's a really healthy, affordable way to live. I'm Andy Philpott. I have come to this group from a background in permaculture. The Blueprint Architect group is comprised of quite a diverse mix of Tower Hamlets residents from all ethnicities and backgrounds and a wealth of different skills and knowledge to contribute. So we feel we're able to kind of reach different parts of the community that we're a part of and say, hey, this is what we can do together. I am Alani Shafiq and I am an amateur mycologist focusing on cultivation of mushrooms using low-tech techniques. Because it's autumn, we're going to be growing grey oyster because they're more forgiving to colder weather. The power of the Blueprint Architect Group is we all care about making a change and we want to redesign the system with food being at the heart of it. To be resilient, you need to have solidarity within sections of community. I'm Zayna Millen and I run a business called Pasa Pasa, which is a pop-up restaurant. This group's unique because it's all to do with giving people the right resources and skills and information so that we can just give back to each other as a community. How it helps the community is that when they learn these skills, they can pass this on to their children. And it's a life skill, not just learning how to grow the vegetables, but how to cook those vegetables. I've got a really big background in growing when it comes to my grandparents. I've always wanted to teach people, especially who are of my background and within my community, exactly how to provide for yourself and your own. It feels really relevant at the moment more than ever because we're in the midst of climate change. Coming together and finding compromises and resolutions to pull the whole of society forward and not just your group of people. I feel like we have to remember that the community is the strongest resource that we have. So on that note, I'd like to invite Laurie and Montplat and the architect groups to come up here and, and see and tell us a bit more about the work that they've been doing over the last two years. Could I get you up, please? Hello. Um, there's many members of the group tonight, but I don't want you to feel pressured. You come here if you want to. Because uh, I just, this this is a group project. This has been, yeah, um, group work. And so it would be lovely to have everyone, as many of you that feel comfortable coming. So yeah, members of the Blueprint Architect Group. Um, Hello, everyone. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed the food. Yes. Yeah. Um, this, this video is um, introducing the Blueprint Architect Group. We've been meeting for uh, two years now. And the reason why we're coming together is. Oh, good. This mic is like. Um, we're, we want to build a blueprint for a community led food system. And part of that work is recognizing that a lot of it is already being done. And a lot of people in the group are working on different aspects of that and in their own ways embodying an alternative way of relating to our food, distributing our food, sharing our food, being in solidarity through food. And we wanted to make this video to be able to share um, what, what the group is about because we're hoping to keep recruiting and to keep building momentum and to build a movement for local food justice in Tower Hamlets, um, which is intrinsically connected to climate justice and yeah, so this video is, is an introduction. We, it's, it's featuring the wonderful Honufa Islam, who's with us tonight. Thank you. She, she contributed to the preparation of the food. Um, and that's the next thing I want to tell you about. I hope you all enjoyed the food. Great. Kiki's uh, the chef. Yes, exactly. And so this food that you hopefully enjoyed, I'm sure you enjoyed it. There was no way you couldn't have enjoyed that. Um, that, that menu, that food is our forward 
to this publication, which is called Seeds for a Revolution, Reclaiming Our Food System. And in it, we basically outline all of our learnings from, it's the beginning of, our, of a series of three, uh, but it captures some of the learnings that we have gathered um, since we started meeting in 2020. Some people have joined us later down the line. Um, but this includes some recommendations about how do we nurture the seeds that are already there of an alternative food system in Tower Hamlets? How can we learn from people who are doing this work? What can we learn from them, from the local projects that are already active? How can we be mindful of what is holding people back from doing more as we basically nurture this, um, this food justice movement, this climate justice movement um, to progress further? And we... You know, often this sort of stuff is is hard to make it accessible, but the work itself is is all about connection and it's all about food. So we thought instead of doing the, the done thing of just like getting someone that people kind of like respect for some random reason to write a forward, <laughs> we thought um, could a recipe or could a menu be our forward? And what is a menu? What is a set of food and dishes that tells the story of the food system that we are actually trying to organize for? in the group. And so we put, you know, we brought together a few people from the group, whoever could um, could make it that day. And we put our heads together on like, how can we tell the story of what we've been doing and what we've been dreaming of, what we've been trying to organize for? How can we tell that story in just one meal for all of you to enjoy and for you to basically for it to be the introduction, you know, to, to this publication. Um, and the wonderful Kiki then transformed all of that brainstorming into the meal that uh, you ate today, so I'm just going to pass it on to Kiki uh, for her to explain, you know, how how is the food that you ate, like what story it tells, and how we source the different things, and why essentially why we cooked that specific meal for you. Um, and that's it for now for me. Thank you. So hello, yes, it was me that cooked the food. Um, so. We really wanted, when we got together, we really wanted to tell the story of what we do, um, what the architects are all about, and to sort of highlight, as Lorian said, all of the things that we already have in place and how, as chefs or as cooks, we can use those and utilise them and really highlight the work that they are doing really simply um, and in a way that can relate to all of us in some way. It's really accessible um, price-wise. It's available, things that are available throughout the year, um, foods that relate to our cultures or could be added into foods of our cultures um, and obviously made in a, an amazingly climate-friendly way, in a communal way that um, allows so many voices to sort of come through. So uh, the first dish, we decided that we have so many different types of cuisines, loads of different like cultures and heritages in um, Tower Hamlet. So we wanted to have sort of a representation of everything that we are, which is sort of like a melting pot of all of those things together. So our, our hot stew is this warming thing that brings everybody together, uses spices from lots of the different cultures that we're made up from, um, and lots of whole foods and vegetables that have been grown by lots of the individuals, but also things that are really local to us where we live right now. Um, and yeah, just in this interesting way, all of those things come together and they're amazing and natural and they seem like they were always together in the first place. That's really great. And then all of the little side dishes and sauces were just sort of like little nods to all of the individual communities. Um, everything that we had today was uh, probably about 90% of it was organic. We sourced locally from um, an organic market and um, we also used lots of the whole foods, lots of the herbs from all of the, the places that you saw in the film. So um, we've got uh the forest farm they gave us loads and loads of our herbs and also all those herbs were in the botanical drink that you drank in the beginning so that was organic hibiscus from Ajanova, and then all of those lovely herbs that you find all year round 
that was very very exciting um and then we had our salad which was kind of like a little nod to to our irish community so it was like an irish style like colcannon style with the cabbages and the potatoes again things that are like abundant all around and lots of the community projects that we are running grow things like that and they're really available um we then had some parsnip and spring onion fritters which were kind of a little bit of a nod to our caribbean communities they had like loads of thyme and allspice and are really similar to sort of like indo-caribbean food and then um our cracked wheat our sort of like bulgur palau so cracked wheat again wheat something we grow in the uk really abundantly it can be um something really really easily sourced and that was kind of the story that we wanted to tell with that and then with spices that sort of represent our like desi kind of indian bangladeshi pakistani community and mushrooms oh god yeah i forgot about the mushrooms sorry that was like one of the biggest things yes oh my god i'm so sorry so yes the mushroom so we have um alani amazingly grows all of these mushrooms and she didn't have any on hand so that was fine huh oh thanks sorry, sorry um and we didn't have any on hand but they told us about um jelly air mushrooms that grow all around tower hamlets which was so cool so we were able to get some from a chinese supermarket because they're quite prevalent in that culture as well but yeah again so all of the a lot of the food much of it could be foraged um the last really exciting thing sorry i won't tell you about all of them but the last really really exciting thing was um andy where are you um told us <laughs> told us about how a hamlet's having um the emblem of uh elder of the elder tree and of uh elderberry bushes and so we included oh mulberry sorry <laughs> I'm so mad. <laughs> Sorry, mulberry. It was the elder tree. The elder trees were the mushrooms. Sorry. So yes, uh, mulberry. So mulberry trees every year, mulberry bushes. Um, and so yeah, we included some in the in the dessert just to sort of like tie it all together and tie it back to Tower Hamlet. Thank you, everybody. And can we have another hand of a round of applause for the architecture? Can I just say thank you to Laurie um, and Zarina? They've done so much hard work preparing this um, behind the scenes. Thank you. So it's wonderful to hear how board can actually tell the story itself so we don't need us to be standing here telling the story but the board itself I love that the idea that board is there in front of us it tells a story it connects us it unites us and um, and it's just warm and hot it's just like warm and it's like heartwarming and yeah it brings so much emotion behind food whether it's for some people it can be quite traumatic but for most of us there is this um, very loving feeling towards food Right. So now I'm going to ask the panel members to come up. So we have Loria, um, D Woods, Sarah Williams, and Samaya Zanet. Right, so we've got this amazing panel members here who've all got a lot of experience from different parts of, of the in society, different parts of the world that they're connected to. So I'm going to actually start off with Dee Woods, who's just actually back from the Caribbean. Is that right, Dee? <laughs> right, so Dee is probably the goddess of food justice and environmental justice. Right, so we are in a very privileged place here to be with Dee. 
Right. Um, so, D, so can you tell me, well, what does climate justice look like in the food system and why is it important? Why are we having these conversations? So climate justice would be the opposite to everything we have now in this current um, dominant global food system. Um, it means that people um, are valued um, and not extracted from. It means our planet um, and biodiversity um, isn't extracted from and, and destroyed. And it means that everyone can eat. Um, and that has been my work for most of my career within food and being able to write this policy paper um, to find, you know, the inroads or policy levers, as, as we say, has been a bit of a task because we're in these multiple um, crises, you know, from COVID-19 um, to this cost of living, this um, food crisis. I want to say food crisis is a food crisis of commodities because you'll find that most local communities are able to produce their own foods and feed their communities. So that's when crisis is. It lies with corporations losing control um, of food. And to me, that's the most important thing. When we have control of our food systems, our food sovereignty, um, then we've achieved climate justice. So you say that food has become a commodity, right? So are you saying that food should be free? Um, well, if we're going to change our economy and move away from, you know, a capitalistic world, Yes. I love that. I love the idea of having free food for all. So I think we should start a new movement called Free Food for All. So, yes. Um, so should, I'm, I'm with you, Dee. I'm yeah, with you. Food should be a public good. And that's one of the key policy asks um, within this paper. It's one that sustainers ask for as well. And many other people, food should be a public good and available to everyone and not um, left to the market to decide prices. Thank you. Right, so I'm going to turn over to Lorium now. So Lorium, Dee talked about the food system being quite extractive and exploitive. Right, so can you give us a little bit of background about what does that mean and then where does that come from? Sure. Um, yeah, when I was thinking about that question, what does... Um, the question is, what does climate justice look like in our food system? Yes, that one. <laughs> what does climate justice look like in our food system? All the, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is history. The food system that we have today is inherited from a system of colonialism. A lot of the foods that uh, people have been eating in the West have been made available through a history that was basically relying on colonizing certain places, putting certain people in either conditions of forced labor, enslavement. Um, and so there's loads of communities across the world that have been exploited and extracted from alongside the land. And that's, that's the history of, of the food that we eat today because the system that provided food back then has basically merged and transformed into this capitalist, the capitalist economy that we operate with today. And I think this is something that frustratingly gets forgotten about quite often when we think about climate justice, you know, around food in the West and we think about technical solutions and we think about, you know, emissions and we think about, and when we look back at the history and we look back at the ideas that made this extraction and this exploitation possible, both of the land and of communities across the globe, we understand that the repair and the justice needs to start with how are we going to relate to each other? 
how are we going to center and protect the people who in many ways are descending from the communities that were the most exploited and the most um, extracted from through this history that that is at the root of the system that feeds us today still. Uh, I come from an island uh, called, two islands actually, called Martinique and Guadeloupe. Most of the land in these islands is used for sugarcane um, plantation, banana plantation. Um, and what sparked my climate justice consciousness was realizing a few years ago that the most of the land and most of the population is now contaminated with a pesticide that was approved on these islands despite known toxicity of these pesticides because we needed to keep selling banana and send them to Europe and send them to France. And so when, when we start looking at these examples and these stories and all of the ways in which people in places like Tower Hamlets and the UK are connected to diaspora communities all around the world, we start understanding that the repair needs to be about remembering and looking at how can we center the people who who have the remedies because they've had to create the remedies like for centuries. And I guess to connect it to the work that we're trying to do in the group, it's making sure that if we are trying to organize a community-led food system in Tower Hamlets today, how do we make sure we center the people who are still on the front line of these ideas of exploitation and extraction? And that means communities of color, that means working class communities, the people who have been, who have had to like, um, work for food to be accessible for the masses, to be exploited for food to be accessible for the masses. And if, if we don't center these voices in how we imagine a different food system, we're not going to create a different food system. We're just going to see more of the same. And sometimes it means slowing down. We might not have all of the fancy technical bougie solutions on like, you know, how to make sure we emit less carbon or, you know, although that is definitely part of, you know, what we need to be thinking about. It's like, how do we recreate a way of thinking about economy, a way of thinking about resources, a way of thinking about what is enough? That means we're more likely to actually, through time and through organizing, to, to see something new emerge, something different that, that is not about exploitation. Yeah. Thank you. So that's really um, a great place to bring Samaya in, right? So... Samaya has just stepped in at the last minute because unfortunately Ruth Jones MP, who's the Shadow Minister for DEFRA, wasn't able to make it. So thank you, Samaya. Really appreciate you stepping in at last minute. But Samaya, so Lorian was talking about like putting people's voices right at the centre, people with lived experience, people that have experienced or are descendants of those that have experienced this exploitation and extraction. Do you think that those communities uh, think it's important for climate justice to be at the heart of their food system? Sorry, I'm not MP, but hi, guys. Um, <laughs> not yet, maybe one day. Um, I think the existence of the Blueprint Architect group shows that, like, we do care. Like, we have people from every facet of the food system within the group. And, like, we have people from every part of our community within the group. Um, and actually, I think it's important um, and something I've learned from this group is that you can't like the food system is not just a facet of environmental injustice. Actually, like they're the same thing. Like, we've got these same systems of extraction um, kind of shaping all of our lives in many different ways, which is why we have within the Blueprint Architect group people working in so many different ways um, on food. So like we've got doctors looking at disability justice. Um, We've got people looking at, I'm looking at housing justice. Um, we're approaching this through a variety of, lens, of lenses based on what is important to us. Um, and I think actually like something really important is recognizing the power of the community because um, we're not just kind of working towards this imaginary food system that doesn't exist. Like the food system we want already exists. It's just about connecting the dots. Like we have from seed to plate to waste management all the way around, we have everyone within the group um, but it's not like we just don't have the dots joined yet. And actually, like, yeah, I think an important part of that is like Lorian was saying, like extending our idea of the community beyond what we assume it to be. Like, it's not just the people we live with. It's not just the people we see on the streets every day. It includes people in the global south. It includes unhoused people, um, undocumented people, imprisoned people. Like we are all members of the same community. And actually, like we have the solutions 
for like our own futures within us um and it's just about like coming together and like you were saying like moving away from extraction and like ensuring that we have the resources ourselves to be able to kind of treat each other with love and care and like build a world like build a food system like but build also like an entire world based on those principles like we do yeah like we do have something to contribute and we are i think each and every one of us, whether you're in the Blueprint Architect group, whether you think about food or not, you're each contributing to this community in a way. And it's just recognizing, like, how can you be, like, doing something different? How can you be doing more? How can you be more in line with your community and, like, a better member of your community? Right, so now I'm going to bring Sarah in. Sarah Williams is Program Director of Sustain, and you've been working on the Bridging the Gap program, Sarah. So you've heard now the passion, the real passion, the true passion, both from Dee, Laurie M, and from Samaya here, about the changes happening. People are doing things. People want to do things. But what needs to be done at policy level? What can be done at policy level? Um, yeah, thank you for some amazing introductions and already thinking, oh, how do I change what I'm going to say to reflect all of that? I think one of the things that I was just thinking was it's really sometimes it's really hard to dream. It's really hard. We're so busy, particularly in the work we do. I think Dee probably feels the same. We're so bogged down in the problems that we have at the moment in terms of the food system and all of the sort of the uh, the other impacts of our of our sort of capitalist um, you know neoliberal society. And we're we're finding incredible ways to work around the system, patch it here, fix it there, come together, you know, campaign and fight. But sometimes it's can be really difficult to sort of look up and and so this is sort of what does climate justice look like in the food system? It's like okay, what could it look like and to me, it's really simplest level. It's about everybody having the right to grow, to access and to afford that food that is good for people, good for the community, good for planet, that honours the natural systems that keep us alive and values those and gives people rights to land and rights to, to you know, if we haven't got rights to the land, we're done for, right? Land rights is really key to this. So our food systems need to operate within those planetary boundaries and not risk the lives of people now or people in the future. And that, you know, is a, doesn't matter where you live on this planet. Uh, our food systems shouldn't shouldn't impinge on your right to life and a good life. And and then it sort of starts to dip into well, it, what it look, doesn't look like is is what we have now, which I think is what Dee was saying. So you know, it doesn't have that concentration of power within those monopolised um, food industrial systems. It doesn't monopolise the profits and, and the resources. Um, and it builds community and community wealth through that supply chain. It provides fair wages and it recognises some of the stuff, you know, Dee has been campaigning for around unpaid labour. And this does really mean more localised food systems. It's not commoditized, So I think that is really key. Um, and I don't know if we're saying goodbye to coffees and, and bananas at this moment in time. I'm not sure that would be a particularly popular thing to bring. But we do need to look at where and how our food is traded and how much we eat of certain types of food and how we get that balance. But importantly, it's about celebrating food, conversation about food, understanding and valuing where food come from. And, and I also have got this bugbear about maybe we all need to understand the basic economic systems um, that enable trade and fairness in the supply chain. I think that, you know, we all need to up our economic literacy so that we can uh, argue for the right sort of economic systems that, that bring climate justice, not fight against it. Um, I think that expensive as a, as a concept needs to be reframed as valuable. Um, and, and this really is the backstory towards uh, behind the Bridging the Gap programme that, that we've been working on at Sustain. Um, and we were asked by the funders to think about a big problem and our vision to solve it. And so our big dream really is that the gap between communities on lower incomes and those experiencing health inequalities um, is bridged and so that everybody can afford planet friendly food um, and, and enjoy a universally healthy, just and sustainable food system. Um, and Bridging the Gap is trying to focus on one key gap issue, which is price. Um, we acknowledge that everything is complicated. Um, 
Uh, but the reason that we've chosen that is because what you were saying about values and the and the values that people have, I think there's some really unhealthy uh, discussions and they're quite misleading that people don't care about where their food is coming from and how it's grown. I don't, I, I think that if, if people were offered the choice between an organic pint of milk and a non-organic pint of milk or banana or salad, everyone would choose the organic one. Um, no one would actively seek out the, un, you know, the, the conventionally farmed one. And so therefore I think that people do care and they have the right to live out those values. They have the right to live out their values when they're shopping, when they're eating. They, they need to have access to the sort of food that represents those values. And, and everyone should be part of a culture that puts a value on food and puts a value on the people that bring the food to our plates and our bellies. Um, so, but currently the systems that govern our choices not only do, do they not encourage climate justice, but they actively block it. And that's the problem is that we're always working around this broken system. And that's shown in the fact that the food that is bad for our health and bad for the planet is often cheaper than food, which is good. And that just doesn't make any sense. Like we just live with it. We just accept that every day, but that is just fundamentally the wrong picture. And that's what, that's what Bridging the Gap is trying to address. It's justified it by keeping people's incomes low. So then you say, well, we can't put the price of food up because people can't afford it. It's like, again, it's it just putting layers and layers of broken system thinking together. Um, because who pays the price for the damage that this food does to our environment, to our health? Um, you know, who's really paying that price? We know it's the poorest people. We know it's the, the, the state probably picks up a large bit of those bills and the people living in the poorest parts of the world. while while the, the, the companies and the institutions get richer. So bridging the gap is trying to think differently to dream a bit, a bit bigger. What if we take away that price difference? What else would we need to do to bring uh, planet and climate friendly food to everybody? Um, what benefits would that bring? And then we can go off and we can advocate and we can create the policy changes that we need. Um, we have a food and farming system that is heavily subsidized we don't think that that's a problem, but the subsidy needs to go to the right bit, to the right people and to the right sorts of, of food and farming. Um, so we also want to start to bridge this gap in the food and farming movement itself, because I think artificially uh, we have a sort of division in the movement. We, we all share the same vision, but it's really difficult uh, to be on the same page when you're delivering things on, on the grassroots. Um, so, for example, we see bridging the gap as a bit of a, the analogy is on one side of the bank, you've got agroecological, environmental activism, and on the other side, you've got the health movement and those working on food access. And down the middle, you've got this torrent of the broken food system. And people are trying to make steps across, but it's too powerful and it's too big. So that's why we really think we need to take that real systems view to see how we bring those two discussions together. And I think this is what we're starting to hear tonight is that people are on the same page and we just need to find those ways, ways to work together. Um, so, yeah, just to finish, really, um, you know, it's 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 a big, sticky, complex, knotty issue um, and we're we're facing it full on. We're facing it head on and we're really taking quite a systems based collaborative approach, putting people at the centre of the decision making, obviously following on from the sort of principles of the way that that you're working. And a lot of people are working now around how do we co-produce these ideas um, and who makes the decisions for who and how we embed some di diverse voices in making those really um, fantastic solutions that will work. Thank you. So I like that. I like what you said about we don't dream enough, right? Um, so I'm going to come back to that bit in a little while. But before that, um, we've, got, we've got a short video to show you. We've got two videos actually to show you. One is a trailer of Vandana, Vandana Shiva's documentary. Vandana Shiva is, um, is for, for those that work in full justice, know that she's an eco-feminist and she has been fighting for the right of the food and um, seed sovereignty. So she's been globally taking on big food giants and dedicated most of her life to that. So we're going to hear a bit more about Vandana Shiva's work through the documentary as a small trailer. And once that's over, then we're going to, that 
video is going to be followed on by another video. And this video is an interview with Vandana Shiva. And one of the architect groups and a member of WEN, Shahida Aziz. Can we have a round of applause? Um, she was able to interview Vandana. Vandana was in India, so it's an online video. So there are a couple of technical glitches, so we do apologize for that, but it is well worth watching. So over to you. Food is a weapon. When you sell real weapons, you control armies. When you control food, you control society. But when you control seed, you control life on Earth. Industrial farming is the single biggest destructive force on the planet today. The war against the Earth begins in the minds of men. And I mean men. Vandana Shiva is one of the most prominent activists in the world. Oh my God, he's a hero. This is Bandana Shiva. I'm Dan. That's a part of Bandana. She's a warrior to the patriarchal system that destroys. Vandana was one of the pioneers who started the global seed movement. Owning intellectual property right on seed is a pathetic attempt at seed dictatorship. We started to fight GMOs through growing seeds and saving seeds. She does knowingly make statements which are clearly inaccurate and incorrect. Demonizes modern agriculture. The organic elite. Anyone who's going to stand up to big corporations is going to come under attack. 40% of the solution to climate change lies in organic ecological farming in the hands of small farmers. Today, one of the big movements is around regenerative agriculture. We have the power, we will change, and we will be the change we want to see, and no one is going to stop us. Bandana Shiva is Monsanto's worst nightmare. We will not be stopped. We have a duty to save seeds. Little old lady from India. <laughs> oh, why does she drive you nuts? <laughs> second video is dropped. Thank you so much. Um, so Dr. Vandana Shiva, a warm welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being with us and we are so honoured to have you. Um, my name is Shaheda Aziz. I work for WEN, Women's Environmental Network. We're a charity based in East London working on issues that link gender, health, equality and the environment. We work in partnership with many grassroots organisations linked with policy work. Uh, your work has inspired and informed WEN's work throughout, and your pioneering eco-feminist principles has led the way for many of us to follow. We are so grateful to have you with us. Thank you so much. Um, the topic of our forum this evening is what would climate justice look like in our food system? And uh, we would like to ask you firstly, why is climate justice connected to food justice? And why is it crucial to have an intersectional feminist lens when thinking of these issues? Uh, first, greetings to the Women's Environment Network. I don't think you will know that in 1988, when my book, Staying Alive, was published, it was the Women's Environment Network that organized a big conference around it in London. So it's good to be back. How is climate justice linked to food and how is it linked to gender? Um, I wrote a book in the lead up to the Copenhagen summit because I could see that the boundaries that had been most ruptured were the biodiversity boundary, were the boundary of nitrogen. 
And where did this come from? The chemical monocultures of the industrial agriculture model. And the figures are there. At that time, I had assessed 45% greenhouse gas emissions come from an industrial corporate agriculture shaped by capitalist patriarchy, shaped by powerful corporations, shaped by rich men. And 14% of it comes from the actual production, which includes fossil fuel use for synthetic fertilizers, fossil fuel use for mechanization and getting rid of work on the fields and farms, spraying of glyphosate, also based on fossil fuels. About 18% comes from destroying forests for the limitless appetite of growing commodities which don't feed us. Soya bean in the Amazon, palm oil in the Indonesian rainforests. And then you have another 15 to 20% to destroy food and degrade it with ultra processing, with transport, with huge amounts of packing and waste. I've done studies that show 75% of the waste is related to food packaging. And ultra processed food is 75% of the chronic diseases. So the same system that is destroying the planet's health is destroying our health and destroying women's knowledge, women's work, women's sovereignty. And that's why I started the Navdanya movement to keep food sovereignty and seed sovereignty in women's hands. And the data is so clear that women-centered food and agriculture systems are able to draw down so much carbon because they grow biodiversity on small pieces of land, which is where real food comes from. And that drawdown could help us get 30 gigatons out of the atmosphere if we stopped using fossil fuels and industrial agriculture. I, I prefer to see industrial agriculture as a model shaped by violence, shaped by violent thinking, shaped by greed. Thank you. Our second question, Dr. Shiva, is what does uh, climate justice look like nationally and locally and how do we get there? I come from South Asia, the region that has very little contribution per capita to the climate havoc and yet is the most vulnerable of all regions of the world. The Himalaya is the third pole. We are the longest coastline affected both by sea level rise, coastal erosion, storms, cyclones, which are increasing in intensity and frequency. In the Himalaya, we are losing the snows, the glaciers are melting. And when melting glaciers combine with the fragility that has been created with limitless dam building, just building roads everywhere without taking consideration about the mountains and their rights. What we have is disasters like the 2013 disaster, which washed away 20 to 30,000 people. 2021 disaster washed away 200 people, including destroying the home of the woman who rose first for the Chipko movement, Gora Devi, in a village rainy. And right now, entire towns are sinking. And in the Bay of Bengal, the 1999 super cyclone killed 20 to 30,000 people. But since then, the governments have become extremely well prepared to face these disasters. And the communities and women I work with are finding their own paths of resilience, saving the seeds that can tolerate the salt that comes with the cyclone, the floods that come with incessant rain. And in these seeds of resilience lie the ability to deal with these disasters but you can only deal with the disasters if you create social resilience. And that's why community seed sovereignty, community food sovereignty with women playing the leadership role, both because they are the only ones who hold this knowledge, as well as they are the ones who retain the best of humanity, both in terms of resilience, as well as in terms of renewal, regeneration and rejuvenation of every kind. Thank you so much. In your documentary, The Seas of Vandana Shiva, we see your son following in your footsteps. What did you have to do differently to raise him, if anything, in this patriarchal capitalist world we live in? I think the 
most importantly, just give him absolutely unconditional love and let him flourish on his own terms as a human being. Because capitalist patriarchy makes people shape men in a patriarchal way and women as dependent on patriarchy. And when you live as human beings, men and women, you live your best potential. So I gave him the freedom to choose his path, including when I had a very difficult um, custody battle uh, and uh, and I let him decide where he wanted to go. It, it, I, I challenged the laws that were allowing his father who had left me, but wanted to take, keep control on me through him and treat him like an object. And I said, he's not an object. He's a human being, he's an agent. And, uh, and I managed to change India's laws with that Supreme Court challenge. And he lived through all of it. So, you know, he's had huge feminist education throughout. And most importantly, I have always trusted him to make the right decisions. And I think if, if men could make free choices, they would be far more womanly. They would be far more feminist. They would be far more sharing and equitable about their relationships. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, so our last question for this evening is, um, we heard that in your trailer of your film earlier, uh, you are GM company Monsanto's worst nightmare. Uh, where do you find this mighty, formidable courage? Well, you know, I know Monsanto's big and they had a huge agenda of destroying every seed of the world, having no farmer with any seed, owning the last seed, changing laws everywhere. And for me, just the celebration of life, the freedom of biodiversity and the seed to evolve is such a fundamental truth that that's where I get my strength to defend the freedom of the seed, the freedom of the farmers to save and exchange seed. And every lie that the corporations tell, to me, is still a very, very weak attempt to own the world. And uh, and so, my, you know, my, my struggles and my, my strength comes from love for life, love for freedom, love for the biodiversity that makes our life, and an absolute intolerance to untruth, falsehood, especially when it comes from powerful corporations and powerful people. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Vandana Shiva, for joining us tonight. And we're really happy that we could um, have this time with you. Um, we do have copies of your book at our event uh, this evening. And um, so Terra Viva by Dr. Vandana Shiva, do get your copy. Um, it is at the forum tonight. I have mine. So, um, yeah, enjoy. Thank you so much, Dr. Shiva. Thank you to all of you who have gathered my love and all my strength. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So the one thing that I took away from that was trust, right? Trust in people to do the right thing. And I think we need more of that, that especially funders and um, policymakers, that they need to start trusting us more that we can do the right thing. Right. So I've got a question to the panel, right? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot now. Um, I'm going to start off with D, and, and it's the same question to all of you. Um, I just want you to tell me one thing that really worries you, right? That really worries you about our current food system. And one thing that gives you hope. Um, worry and hope can't live in the same house. Um, and I choose to be hopeful. And I'm hopeful because of all the people around the world who are coming together in community to do things. Um, and, you know, we spoke about dreaming and so many people are unable to dream, um, and we need to dream, all right? 
whether we're hungry, whether we're sick, whether we're fearful, when we come together in community and we dream, we unleash power to change things. And that's why I try to focus more on hope. Cute. Yeah. Sarah? Um, I suppose for me, one of the big worries is how um, is, is how the narrative around a lot of this stuff is shaped. Um, so uh, someone was talking, for example, about the cost of living crisis. Now, I mean, if you've heard that phrase once, like how many times on a daily basis in, in what I do everywhere. And it's like it, it's taking away our hope. It's like the late, late, you know, and, and someone said to me that they've reframed it as a an uh, inequalities crisis, because this is just an accentuation of something that's been going on for decades, if not longer. So, but but people in the media pick up so quickly on these narratives, you know, and, and it takes away our hope and it, and it makes those dominant systems e even more powerful. Um, things like, you know, I, I've got little things like, you know, the, the taking away cash, you know, what that's doing, everything is cardless. And I think it does have a really big impact on some of these systems. But but the hope is 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 there. And I think that, you know, when you look around at people just making the best in a situation where things are so broken and taking on like the big guys. <laughs> they're often our guys and um, so for, for some of you might may or might know um sustain does a lot of work around advertising and trying to challenge those big uh, corporations and their advertising budgets and the way that they're all feeding us and our children all of this stuff about you know what we should be eating and and um and we, you know, we collectively as an alliance stand up to those big corporations and we take them on and sometimes we win. Um, but, you know, they're, they're powerful and yet we still win. And it's the same story we're hearing from Vandana. You know, she takes on the big the big corporations and wins. So I think that gives me hope. It's that possibilism. It's all possible. It's all possible. Thank you. Right. OK, Samaya. Um, I'm going to echo kind of what Dee said, but also um, I'm going to pull this from what all the architects have said in our publication. One of the biggest limitations to the work that we're doing is just simply not having enough time, enough resources, enough support to do this work. Like we're trying to survive out here. We don't have the capacity to be doing more. And it's really worrying. Um, like there are so many constraints to the present that it's hard to like even start to imagine what imagining the future would look like. Um, but actually what gives me hope is that despite all of that, people are still doing the work. People are still like, they're in this room doing things. Um, and I was told not to name drop, but like um, Tina Camp is one of my favorite writers and she writes that actually like to like, we can't just keep imagining the future like our job is to bring that future into the present, to live like that future is our present. And actually that's what people in the Blueprint Architect are doing. Like we're bringing the food system that we want into the present by building those connections of solidarity, of love and care. So that is what gives me hope. It's the people around me. Okay. Mariam? Yeah, I'm gonna echo that. Um, one of the... Um, one of the worrying things, I guess, is that the people who could have the means and who could make decisions to support this work and to actually put a few things in place, trusting the people, trusting the momentum, trusting um, community spaces to like do more of what they're doing, the suspicion, the putting hurdles, the having to sign however many forms before you're able to access a plot, um, but also like the funding sector you know, and the impulse to, you know, want to engineer social change and want to see like however many like, you know, different proof that this community project is achieving X and Y and Z. Um, and I guess like that illusion that we can, again, that we can, yeah, engineer social change instead of actually like trusting people to do what they do best. And at the same time, as, as everybody else has said, what is giving me hope in this context is that people, a lot of people are done begging and a lot of people are actually starting to embody their own power and it's irresistible. It's contagious, you know, seeing people doing what they do, seeing how much joy they bring to their community by embodying something different. Um, I was talking earlier about um, what's happened in my home islands and the pesticide scandal that's 
contaminated most of the land and most of the people. What's, what gives me hope constantly when I look at that context is how many initiatives, food justice initiatives, have mushroomed on the islands since this scandal has like gained more visibility. People who are like, you know, passing skills from, you know, elders to youth around like how to grow seed, recognizing how much indigenous knowledge is still there and can like still be passed on. Um, and it's, it's, it's this strange, yeah, it's this strange moment where in the midst of all of the grief that, that we sit with because of all of the loss and all, all that's been taken from people and from the land, like the, the joy and the resilience and I guess the infinite ability for people's heart to regenerate and to keep trying and to keep, it's the seed, I guess it's like what uh, Vandana was talking about, this life impulse and yeah, as as for all of us, that is also what gives me hope and what's, um, what gets us going, I guess. Thank you. So, so coming back to the dream bit, right? Um, and it can be difficult, like G said, that we don't always have that time space. Sometimes it can be really difficult for us to dream, but also reality is that we're also in it now so that we don't always have to dream like Samia was saying you know the world is now we're living it we can create a different world now so what I'd like you to do is actually turn around to the person behind you rather than the person next to you because most likely you'll know the person next to you so turn around to the person behind you if you're comfortable enough to do that and actually share and I want the panel to do this as well with each other right I'd like you to share your vision of a better food system. What would it look like? What would it actually look like? Right, okay. Find, find a person next to you or behind you, <laughs> right? Preferably somebody you don't know. Yeah, I thought you'd might type it. Right. Okay. Can I get everybody's attention again? Right. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. right. And for those online, if you can just put your answers in the Q&A section, the Q&A session doesn't have to be questions. You can actually put your comments in it. 
So I've been told. So please, if you can join in um, and put your comments in, in the question and answer box. Right. So that was brilliant. So it was really nice to hear everyone chatting away and I could be quiet for five minutes again. Um, right. So thinking about that. Right. So keep that thought in your head. Right. Now, think about one thing, just that one thing that you need to make a difference in that world. What would it be? Right. And I'll give you an example. For me, I go on about having free food for all. Right. And it doesn't sit well with a lot of people, especially food growers who are trying to make a living. But what if the food growers, especially farmers, were paid like we pay our doctors? Right. So we're, we're paying them to grow the food. So they're not, they're not forced to make it a commodity. They're not growing for profit. So for me, if we could pay our farmers from taxpayers' money, I'd happily use my taxpayers' money to pay for farmers. So anybody got any ideas? And I'm going to probably, and, and the panel members, use a free please to chip in here if anybody wants to. Hanufa. Hold on. Hold on, can I give you a mic? Uh, I, I think the government need to give us public some land. And it's going to be for the whole public where we can grow our food and share instead of building lots of housing and making profits. Anybody else? Okay, we've got somebody, a gentleman in the corner. And again, those online, please chip in and put your comments in the Q&A box. So I know a lot of countries have, um, and we even used to have a civic, uh, a national service where people after finishing school would basically have a, a civic duty for one year or two years where they would go and get involved. So farming could be taken out of the hands of professionals and you could just have a constant rotation of young, healthy, fresh individuals going and farming for a couple of years when their bodies are capable of doing it. And yeah, and then after that, they could go on to bigger and better things or stay doing it if they loved it. But that that could be one way that the system could work beyond beyond what you suggested, yeah. So. Brilliant, yeah. Thank um, you. Dee? Sorry to bust your bubble. I pitched that to DEFRA several years ago and they just laughed at me. Uh, well, I'll only run DEFRA if we're in a different um, type of democracy, a real democracy of people and not just the status quo um, coming up with legislation to protect themselves. Um, and, and for me, that is the biggest thing. How do we disrupt and dismantle all these systems of oppression and extraction? A whole system change there. All right. Are, is there any any questions, any comments from people online? Right. Okay. Right. Okay. One more at the back then. Hi, um, I feel we need to, in the space of food especially, we need to learn about supply chains because firstly, we don't really know, obviously, I know from what you've spoken about in the last few hours, where our food comes from. But if we have knowledge of supply chains, then we should then be able to realise the certain crops we used to grow in the UK about 100 years ago, which was like hemp or cannabis. And most people are still going to be thinking like the drug thing. But the fact that every single industry, whether it's the oil industry, the renewables industry, all those industries do not talk about one thing. They don't talk about free energy, what Tesla spoke about. They don't talk about food that you can grow from the plants like hemp and flax. We need to get rid of these stupid connotations that hemp is a drug. No, it is not. It's part of my natural herbal traditions. And we need to bring those crops back and re-educate the people. You're not handling drugs. You're not a criminal. This is a food, just like lettuce, just like flax. Thank you. Yeah, cultural knowledge. We can't lose cultural knowledge. Right, so did you have? I just wanted to cheekily use this moment to tell all of you that we have some uh, recommendations in the publication. Um, we have 
thought about that a lot in the group, thinking about what are the small steps that at the local level we can take to support people who are already embodying this community-led alternative sustainable food system. So if you've got your little one, um, if not, grab one before you go. But it's from page 13 onwards, and there's like a few ideas in there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please do have a look at the publication. Right. And um, now just to round out. So can we just have a round of applause for all the panel members here? Dee, Sarah, Tamia, and Gloria. And before we go on to the entertainment for the night, I do have an announcement to make, some really good news to share with you. And I was hoping that Elle, uh, who has been working really hard on this project, which is about the grants, uh, would have come up to share this. But Elle's feeling a little bit shy, and I'm putting her on the spot. But there is Elle, so we'll wave to Elle. All right. And, right. So um, the good news is that the, there has, we've had an announcement that we can now officially let you all know that the grants uh, making decision for uh, having a Just Food and Climate Transition Programme where we can fund smaller projects um, has been signed up and it's all official and the grant the grant's going to open up um, at the beginning of March, is that right, Elle? The 6th of March. So 6th of March, so please go on to the WEN, WEN web, website and have a look um, for more information. So there is um, over 200, uh, £200,000 available for local community projects in Tower Hamlets. So these projects are will be split into two kinds. So you can apply for the community hub, which is between 1000 and 10000 which is like a seed fund. Or if you've got a bigger project in mind, you can apply for the community labs, which is up to a hundred thousand pounds. Forty, sorry. This is why this is why Elle should have been here. Up to forty thousand pounds, right, right. Ten, and I've got written down there as well to ten to forty thousand pounds, right. There will be information sessions and webinars available. There'll be one-to-one -one support for those that need it because we know that not everybody is um, an expert at applying for funding. Not everybody's e ever even experienced applying for funding. So there will be some support, one-on-one -on -one support available. And we are encouraging as many groups in community uh, in Tower Hamlets to apply for the funding. Um, um, and yeah, and that's about it from me. And we're going to pass it over to Lauriem now. Lauriem has many hats. And tonight, Lauriem is now the musician Lauriem. And Lauriem is going to sing or perform two songs, Anno Levy and Lan Mu. And we'll just go and take a seat. All right. OK. And also, just to let people know that online is now, the people on the line have actually had to go now. So we'll say bye bye to those online. All right. Good. Goodbye.